Welcome. We're glad you've joined us again for our Wednesday night Bible study. It's amazing that we've journeyed together now for almost three months. We're on Revelation, the 13th chapter, and we've sensed the moving of the Holy Spirit. We've really sensed God working in these series. And so thank you for the messages that you're sending and the fact that you are not only enjoying the meetings, but you're being deeply blessed and led closer to Christ through them. Now, a number of you last time asked if there were a book on this series, and there is. It's called Understanding Daniel and Revelation. Uh, it covers the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. You have the complete text of Daniel, the complete text of Revelation, and then I've given you comments on each of the chapters. You can pick this up from Pacific Press, and uh, you can go on to the website of Pacific Press and get it if you'd like. A number of you also wanted the notes. Let me put up a website where you can pick up the notes for this series. You just go to hopelives365.com forward slash weekly Bible study. That's hopelives365.com weekly Bible study. Now, if you have questions for us, we won't take any tonight because we've got quite a comprehensive chapter to cover. But if you have questions, here's what you do. You simply email us. Now, this is an email address, not a website address. You email us at info at hopelives365.com. That's info at hopelives365.com. We're ready to launch right into our study tonight. We'll summarize our study of last week and then go right into Revelation 13. And we're going to cover the first half of Revelation 13, the identity of the beast power as contrasted with the identity of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Next week, we'll cover the last part of Revelation 13. It's such a large chapter, it's difficult to do the one chapter in one session. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for my dear friends that have tuned in tonight to watch our YouTube presentation. We're on a journey together, studying the Word of God, letting Christ speak to us through his Word. I pray that you would bless us in a very special way as we study. Anoint me with your Holy Spirit and open the hearts of those who are um, watching tonight and uh, participating with Bibles open, pens and notepads in their hands. I just pray that you would move in a special way in each of our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Now, you'll recall that last week we studied Revelation, the 12th chapter. And Revelation 12 is a pivotal chapter because it really is the hinge upon which the entire book turns. Last week, we looked at the four episodes or four vignettes in Revelation chapter 12. We've noticed the theme of Revelation 12 is Jesus wins and Satan loses. In that chapter, in these four scenes, first, Satan attacks the principles of God and the plan of God as he battles for the throne of God in heaven. Satan desires worship. There's a battle. Jesus and his angels fight against the dragon or Satan and his angels. You remember in Revelation 12, Jesus is, Satan is pictured as the dragon and the serpent. He's the, Satan is the dragon because he wants to destroy us, the serpent because he wants to deceive us just as he deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden over the issue of immortality. And he said to her that if she ate the fruit, she would not surely die. In other words, she had natural immortality. So just as the devil tried to deceive her, the devil wants to deceive men and women on planet Earth today with falsehoods, with errors, with counterfeit truth rather than the pure truth of God's word. He tries to counterfeit that truth. When you look at the battle between good and evil, it is a battle over the throne of God. It is a battle over worship. So we see in Revelation chapter 12, Satan cast out of heaven. Jesus wins, Satan loses. The next vignette we see in Revelation 12 is Satan attempts to destroy Jesus as he's born. But Jesus is protected by God. An angel appears to Joseph. Jesus and the Holy Family, Jesus and Joseph and Mary, flee into Egypt, where they're preserved of God. 
throughout Christ's life, Satan tried to destroy him in his temptations. But again, Jesus is victorious. Christ goes eventually to the cross where he even in death is victorious. When Christ died, Satan's angels and Satan rejoiced with glee. But Jesus came out of the tomb, resurrected. Satan knew that his plans and programs were doomed. Satan knew that he would lose. But again, Satan tries to destroy Jesus. Jesus wins. Satan loses. We fast forward to a period of time in Revelation 12 called the uh, period of the 1260 years, the time times and half a time, the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Satan tries to destroy God's people. But remember what the Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 6, that they flee into the wilderness where there's a place prepared of God. And then in Revelation chapter 12, later in the chapter, it talks about the fact that they're nourished there. So in the wilderness, they're nourished. That tells us something. Even in the Middle Ages, God had a people that were faithful to him. In the Dark Ages, the light of truth did not go out. But there's a practical application of that truth. When we go through our difficulties and our challenges, Christ prepares a place for us. He nourishes us. Often in trial, difficulty, we learn to trust God more fully. Then we come down to the end of Revelation 12, which really launches us into Revelation chapter 13 and 14 and onward. At the end of Revelation 12, it says the dragon. Now you remember who the dragon was, don't you? Satan was wroth or angry with the woman, the church, and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed or the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and of the faith of Jesus. So just as the devil rebelled in heaven because he wanted to sit on the throne and rule, the cre one of the created beings wanted to rule and reign like the creator and give commands like the creator. The major difference, of course, is Jesus is a loving creator. Everything he asks us to do is, for, is to enable our lives to be happier, to be filled with more meaning and purpose. The devil wanted to rule out of selfish aggrandizement, filled with pride, to lord it over his subjects. So the Bible says the dragon, Satan, is angry with the woman. The church goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's the last body of believers on earth that keep the commandments of God. They are faithful to Christ. They have the testimony of Jesus, or they're guided, as we studied last week, by the gift of prophecy. Now, how does this war take place? What events develop in the war? In Revelation chapter 13, we see the rise of a sea beast and a land beast. These two beasts become allies with Satan. So you have the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast. And in these three, this is the false triumvirate or the false trinity. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working for the salvation of human beings. You have the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast trying to destroy the uh, faith of God's people. So let's go today to look at the sea beast and see how the sea beast contradicts everything that God has said. And the sea beast tries to, again, destroy the people of God. So we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 13, starting there with verse 1. John says, and John is in prophetic vision, you know, every one of these visions that John has are given to us by a loving God to prepare us for his soon return. Every one of these prophecies is not simply to condemn. It's rather to prepare God's people for what's coming. Revelation 13, verse 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. There is so much truth packed in that one verse. Notice it says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Now you remember, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? Daniel and Revelation are companion books. In, Revel in Daniel chapter 7, verse 17, it says, the beast which you saw are kings that arise out of the earth. But a king represents a kingdom. In Daniel 7, verse 23, it says the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. So in the Bible, a beast represents a kingdom. 
Now, it could be a political kingdom or religious kingdom. Remember in Daniel chapter 8, we read about about the ram and the he-goat. And then it defined the ram as Medo-Persia and the he-goat as Greece. Again, animal figures or beasts represent kingdoms. We read about the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon. In Daniel 7, representing kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So where does this beast arise from? Did you see it in your Bible? Revelation 13, verse 1. Where does the beast arise from? From the sea. What does the sea represent? Revelation chapter 17. And look there at Revelation 17. And you're going to be looking at Revelation 17 and verse 50. What does the sea represent? Revelation 17, verse 15. And he said to me, the waters or the sea which you saw where the whore or the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So according to the Bible, did you jot that down in your notes? According to the Bible, what does the sea represent? It represents peoples. So it represents nations or tongues. So if we see a beast, a political or religious power arising out of the sea, we see a religious or political power rising out of the peopled areas of the earth. Now, it says, he has seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So the ten horns, what do the horns have on them? Crowns, which means that they're reigned by kingly authority. When we studied Daniel chapter 2, you remember the great image, the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron, Four metals in descending value, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But then you have the ten toes of the image representing the divided Roman Empire. When When you look at Daniel 7, you have the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the dragon. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. But remember, out of the dragon, you have ten horns, the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. So what do we find here in this beast We find ten horns with crowns representing, of course, the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. Now you ask me, what about the seven heads on this beast? Heads are symbols of authority, symbols of power. And if you look down through history, from the perspective of Bible prophecy, we always want to be consistent. So you have the seven great empires. You have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome. Then you have the breakup of the Roman Empire. Roman Empire breaks up. What power then follows that breakup of the Roman Empire at the end of the Dark Ages? You have the rise of France, which would be your fifth, which is, 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 is well, let me go back a minute, before France. You have Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome. Then you have out of Rome this little horn power that rises which, of course, is a false religious power, the papacy. Then after the papacy, you have France representing secularism, humanism, godlessness. And after that, you have the rise of the United States. So the seven heads would be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, followed by papal Rome. We'll study more about that today. Then secularism, humanism, godlessness, followed by France, and then, of course, the United States in Bible prophecy. So you have all of this pictured there. Now, it says that upon his head's the name of blasphemy. We're going to look at that shortly, but we must move on uh, to identify this beast. Verse 2, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. So what's he like? A leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a what? Bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And a dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. So where do we read about these before? You remember in Daniel chapter 7. Let's go back to Daniel 7 and take a look at it. Because you're going to see these exact same four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. So in Daniel 7... Daniel speaks, and uh, he says in verse 3, Daniel 7, verse 3. Do you have it there? I want to show you how the Bible is linked together. 
in one indissoluble unity. Daniel 7, verse 3, the four beasts that came up from the sea were different from one another. The first was like a what? Lion. Did we read about a lion in Revelation 13? We did. It was a composite beast. It's like a lion. Verse 5, another beast like a what? Bear. Did we read about a bear? Yes. And then look, verse 6, I beheld another and lo, like a leopard. So this is very similar, but this is a composite beast, and I'll explain why. Then it talks about verse 7, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, strong, exceedingly. It had great iron teeth, devoured broken pieces, stamped the residue with its feet. Um, and then look, verse 8, I considered the horns. There came up among them. Well, we'll go to the end of verse 7. The beasts that were before it had ten horns. The beast in Revelation 13 had what? Ten horns, didn't it? And then comes what after that? There came up from among them another little horn. And this little horn power, according to Daniel 7, would attempt to change the very law of God. So you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, lion, bear, leopard, dragon. Then you have the rise of this little horn power, which ultimately, according to Daniel 7, verse 25, attempts to change the very law of God. So when we go back to Revelation chapter 13, we are looking at a composite beast that has the features of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. But there's an interesting clue. We're going to look at a number of clues here of the identity of this beast, this political power. I should mention that the beasts in the Bible are not persons. They're not individuals. They're political powers or religious powers. Notice it says in the end of verse 2, the dragon gives him power and his seat and great authority. So, now, who is the dragon? Well, in Revelation chapter 12, it says, you'll remember, Revelation chapter 12, and um, you're going to look there at verse 9. The great dragon, this is Revelation 12, was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which he deceives the whole world. He's cast out into the earth. His angels are cast out with him. So the, the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan. But Satan has to work through an earthly power. What earthly power did Satan work through in the time of Christ? It was pagan Rome, wasn't it? It was a pagan Roman governor that tried Jesus. It was pagan Roman soldiers that nailed Jesus to the cross. It was a Roman, pagan Roman seal, imperial Rome, that was on the stone that sealed the tomb. It was indeed the dragon was working through pagan Rome. So this then passage says in Revelation 13, verse 2, last part, the dragon, pagan Rome, would give him this new beast power that's rising up, that's a composite power, his power, his seat, and great authority. So then we might ask, who, according to history, who did pagan Rome give its authority to? Well, let's look at a little history. You remember the Ten Horns. You have the barbarian tribes, these ten barbarian tribes that are coming down from the north, carving up the Roman Empire. Constantine is incredibly, incredibly nervous. You have the Huns, the Alamanni, the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Suevi, the Vandals, the Burgundians, etc. And as Europe is being carved up, and as the Roman Empire is falling apart, Constantine moves his empire, the capital of his empire, from Rome to Turkey, modern-day Turkey today. We would call it Constantinople or Istanbul. So when Constantine moves his empire, it le the capital it leaves a vacuum. And I want to read to you from Baldassar La Blanca, who was a history professor at the University of Rome. Who did pagan Rome give its authority, give its throne to? Here's what Professor La Blanca says. To the succession of the Caesars, came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. So the Caesars, the pagan Roman emperors are fading away, and the 
pontiff is rising in authority. Now, according to Stanley's history of Eastern Europe, uh, page 197, Arthur Stanley, one of the more prominent historians, puts it this way, by retiring, he, Constantine, left the field clear for the bishops of Rome. The papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. So we find then very clearly that papal Rome took the position of pagan Rome. The first clue then in identifying this beast power is where did he get its authority from? He got it from pagan Rome. But we continue here, verse 3. And as I saw, one of its heads, as it were, wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed. We'll come back to that. And all the world wondered after the beast. So, and then it says in verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who's like unto the beast, who's able to make war with him? So this second clue is that this is a worldwide system of worship. It's a political, religious power that rises out of pagan Rome, out of imperial Rome, and it indeed demands or commands worship. It's a power that is to be worshipped. The controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan, is over worship. But we get the, so that's the second clue. The first clue is its origin. Its throne comes from pagan Rome. Second clue is that it is a worldwide system of worship. Here is your third clue, verse 5. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. We'll come back to the 42 months. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. How do you blaspheme God's name? By having the priv by claiming you have the privileges and prerogatives of God, or by claiming you're equal, equal with God, you know there is none like God. You remember how Isaiah puts it? He says there is none like me. So God is supreme. If indeed one one can blaspheme His name by by claiming equality with God, notice also it says they blaspheme His tabernacle. That is the very dwelling place of God in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary was the Shekinah glory of God. And what was in the heavenly tabernacle? Do you remember? What, what, was, what was manifest there? Well, the Ark of the Covenant. What's in the Ark of the Covenant? The law of God. So you blaspheme the tabernacle by attempting to change the law of God that was written with his own finger on tables of stone. Now, in the Bible, it does define blasphemy, and it helps us know what blasphemy is in Scripture. Let's go back to a couple passages in the Bible to try to discover what blasphemy is all about. We're going to go back first to Luke chapter 5, verse 21. Luke 5, verse 21. According to the Bible, what indeed is blasphemy? Luke 5, and you'll find it there in the 21st verse. You remember there was a time that Jesus was claimed to be a blasphemer. Why did they claim Jesus was a blasphemer? Luke 5, verse 21. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You remember the story. Jesus had just healed a man, and Jesus had claimed your sins were forgiven. But here they say Jesus is blasphemer. Why? Because they knew that only God could forgive sins. Was Jesus a blasphemer? Absolutely not. Why not? Because Christ is a manifestation of the Father. There are three divine separate beings in the Godhead. But if we want, remember what Philip said? He said, Master, show us the Father. And Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus is a manifestation of the Father in the, in the idea that he, he reveals the Father's love, reveals the Father's goodness. And uh, here, why could Jesus forgive sins? Because he was divine, a representative of the Father. He had divinity, and only divinity can forgive sin. Now, does the papal system claim that it has the power to forgive sin? 
Here is um, Michael Mueller in his book, The Catholic Priest, uh, pages uh, 78 and 79. And uh, it's the, written, has the imprimata of the church, the Catholic church. He writes, seek where you will throughout heaven and earth, and you will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner. Who can free him from the chains of sin and hell? And the extraordinary being is the priest, the Catholic priest. Who can forgive sins except God was the question which the Pharisees sneeringly asked. Who can forgive sins is the question which Pharisees of the present day also ask. And I answer, there is a man, now this is Michael Mueller speaking, on earth who can forgive sins, and that man is the Catholic priest. Now listen as it goes on. Yes, beloved brethren, the priest not only declares that the sinner is forgiven, but he really forgives him. He really forgives him? What does the Bible say? Jesus says, if we confess our sins, he, Christ, is faithful and just to forgive our sins. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. I remember when I first began to discover these eternal truths in the Bible, and I began to sense that freedom of coming to Jesus. You know, I was brought up in a lovely Catholic home, but then I began to study the Bible with my father who had become a Seventh-day Adventist. And my whole life was changed and transformed. And, and I, I began to sense that I could kneel by my bed and I didn't have to wait for an earthly priest because I had a heavenly priest, Jesus Christ. And I, I just praised God for the peace, the joy that Jesus gave me in forgiving sin. You know, the Bible says that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace, Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 and onward, and find grace to help in time of need. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, it says that Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. The incredible good news is we need a priest and we have a priest. We need a priest and we have a priest. It is true that we're not righteous enough to approach God. We're not holy enough. But it's also true that no, every earthly priest is not righteous and holy either. They have sinned. And the priest would need a priest. And the priest that we need is not an earthly priest. It's Jesus Christ the heavenly priest. We can come and, and ask him for forgiveness and he will indeed forgive. Now listen to this statement where Michael Mueller writing in the book, The Catholic Priest, he's describing his works. He says, yes, beloved brethren, the priest not only declares the sinner is forgiven, but he really forgives them. That statement is frankly not true. Jesus is the only one that can forgive us. The priest raises his hand, he says, and pronounces the word of absolution. In an instant, quick as a flash, the chains of hell are burst asunder. The sinner becomes a child of God. So great is the power of the priest. This is, a, this is amazing. That the judgments of heaven itself are subject to his decision. I say it kindly, but it needs to be said. That's blasphemy. Because blasphemy is when any human being declares that they have the authority of Christ to forgive sin. But there's another aspect of blasphemy we find in the book of John. And uh, here we go to John chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus again is claimed to be a blasphemer. And uh, here we look at uh, the Gospel of John. And you'll find here again this uh, tremendous um, statement in the Gospel of John. It's actually chapter 10, verse 33. John chapter 10, verse 33. It was Luke 5, 21, and I got them mixed up in my mind. John chapter 10, verse 33. Here we go. This is another definition we find of blasphemy in the Bible. John 10, verse 33. It says, The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Now, how did they define blasphemy? And because that thou or you being a man makes yourself God. So what is blasphemy? Blasphemy is when any human being tries to exalt themselves to be claiming to be God. You say, does the church do that? Do priests or popes do that? Well, let me read you another um, one. This one comes from uh, an, an, a very fascinating book, again, that has the imprimatur of the priest uh, in it, it's Lucius Ferris, the Prompta Biblioteca, printed in Rome. It's a summary 
of the 84 points. It's an English translation of it, pages 26 and 29. He says, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he's not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. Hence, the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth in the lower regions. The Pope, as it were, God on earth, the chief of king of kings, entrusted by the omnipotent God to govern the earthly and heavenly kingdoms. Now, that, that statement is amazing, that God has placed the Pope as a God on earth, and he is to rule. Notice what this writing in Rome says at the Vatican. It says he's to govern earthly and heavenly kingdoms. In other words, there is the anticipation even in Rome that one day the papal power will be over earthly and religious or heavenly kingdoms. That reminds us of the echoes of the book of Revelation that talk about the union of church and state, the erosion of religious liberties, the time when the papal power will reign supreme. Now, so we've had three clues so far. Clue number one, that the, this beast power will get its authority from pagan Rome, the papacy did. Clue number two, that the papal power, that this beast power would be a worldwide system of worship, the papacy is. Clue number three, that it would be a blasphemous power claiming the power to forgive sins and equality with God. It, 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 it was. Now let's continue in Revelation chapter 13 and see this final conflict between good and evil. Revelation, the 13th chapter. And we're going to look there at Revelation 13. We have gone down through verse 6. We're going to look at verse 7. And it was given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all tongues, kindreds, and tongues, and nations. What does it mean to make war with the saints? Who are the saints? You know, when you read the epistles of Paul, he says, to the saints at Ephesus, to the saints at Colossia, to the saints at Philippi. Who are the saints? They're the believers. So this predicted that the beast power would be a persecuting power, that uh, faithful men and women of God would be burned at the stake. They would be persecuted by this power. They would be hunted down. During this period known as the Dark or Middle Ages, when the church dominated earthly and religious kingdoms, during this period of time, the faithful people of God were persecuted. Many fled to the regions of northern Italy, southern France. They lived in mountains. They lived in forests. I remember on an occasion I was leading a tour to the Waldensian Valleys, and we hiked back into the woods and came down into a cave. And it was a large cave, and we were probably 40 or 50 of us were in there. We began to sing great hymns of the church, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. You know, all the powers of hell cannot destroy the power of Christ. And as we were singing, we did it by flashlight in there. I recounted the story of how a few hundred people met in that cave. They were so frightened. The armies of Rome were approaching. They were hunting them like hunted animals. And finally, these armies of Rome built a fire at the front of the cave, smoked them out, and as they came out, everyone was slaughtered. This power would make war with the saints and it, the papacy under its authority of civil Rome actually did. But some said that mathematical proof is an exact proof. And um, I wanna look at verse eight, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose uh, names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. We're going to come back to that. If any man has an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword shall be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Do you remember that earlier in the chapter, we read about in verse 5, there was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. His power was given unto him to continue 42 months. So the, the beast power, the papacy that dominated Europe, would reign for 42 months. Now, in Bible times, in Hebrew, um, calculations, 
there were 30 days in a biblical month. So 30 times 42 or 1260. So this power would reign for 1260 prophetic days. In the Bible, we've studied this before, Ezekiel 4, verse 6, Numbers 14, verse 34, one prophetic day equals one literal year. So the 1260 prophetic days equal 1260 years. How does that fit in? You have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. You have the breakup of the Roman Empire, the Imperial Rome, Pagan Rome, from about 351 to 476 AD. So we would expect after 476 AD, the papacy that had existed before that time would now rise to power and receive civil and religious authority. Justinian, the pagan Roman emperor, sensed what was happening in his empire, and he gave to Pope Vigilus II in 538 AD both civil and religious power. So if the papacy begins to reign at 538 AD, and if indeed that's the beginning of the Middle or Dark Ages, we then should look for 1260 years in the future for something that's going to happen. And what did it say in Revelation 13 was that very event that was going to happen. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that uh, kills with the sword shall be killed with the sword. So we would expect at that time the head of the papacy to go into captivity, 1798, because the papal power would exist in strong for 42 months, 1260 years. That would run out in 1798. What would happen in 1798? The Pope would go into captivity. Napoleon is ruling in France. He looks to the south. He sees his rival, the papacy. He says, I've got to attack. He sends General Berthier down in 1797. Berthier comes back. No, not Berthier. He sends another French general down in 1797. That general comes back empty hand, can't get the Pope. 1798, Napoleon then sends Berthier down. And Berthier goes down in 1798, exact fulfillment of the prophecy. Pope is taken captive. He dies in Valence, France. Now, we've seen that in Revelation chapter 13, the beast power is not a person. It's a system. Let me assure you that there are many lovely Roman Catholics. They love Jesus Christ with all their hearts, but they are living in spiritual darkness. They have, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 25, there is a way that seems right to the man, but the ends are of the way of death. So the way seems right to them, but they've never had the truth of God exposed to them. That's why tens of thousands of lovely Roman Catholic Christians who love Jesus are hearing the call of God, and the Spirit of God is speaking to them, and they're accepting the truth of God, and they're stepping out to follow Christ. But there is a very interesting contrast in Revelation 13 between the beast and the lamb. Did you see that in Revelation chapter 13? Um, Revelation chapter 13, and uh, you're looking there at uh, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The beast power slayed others who didn't go along with them during the Middle Ages. But here, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? It means that when God created the human race, he created the human race with free will. That will could not be coerced or forced. The beast power tried to force will. But the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who created the human race with the capacity to, to have free will, knowing that they could fall, he then, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, met in a divine council meeting. And as they did, they developed they, the, the plan of salvation. Love in the heart of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit led them to make a divine plan, to initiate a divine plan that Christ would come. They would live the life we should have lived, face all of Satan's temptations head on, die the death we should have died, be resurrected, ascend to heaven in our behalf. Jesus is our dying lamb. Jesus is our living priest. And as you look through the entire book of Revelation, the Lamb of God is mentioned at least 28 times in Revelation. And the Lamb of God is mentioned as the one who died for us. And because Christ died for us, he took upon our guilt, our shame, our condemnation. We can be victorious over Satan. 
Whoever you are, your sins can be forgiven. Whoever you are, you can be redeemed by the grace of Christ. Whoever you are, let the love of Christ win your heart. Revelation chapter 5, John looks up into heaven, and as he looks up into heaven, he sees an angel with a scroll in his hand. And the question is, who's worthy to open the scroll of judgment? Who's worthy to open that scroll? And the answer comes back in Revelation 5, verse 5. John says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look therein. And one of the elders said unto me, verse 5, Don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. Verse 6, And I beheld, and he sees these heavenly beings around the throne of God. Then, what does he see? He sees the book being opened. Verse 8, When he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps of God. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Uh, in verse 6, John looks up and he sees in the middle of that verse, it says, verse 6, Beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, in the midst of the four beasts, midst of the elders stood a lamb, having been slain. John looked up and he saw all of heaven worshiping. He saw all of heaven praising God and singing, Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and power and honor. Satan wants to usurp the throne of God. So Satan works through earthly powers. One of those powers is the beast power, a false system of religion, a political religious system. But here, the Lamb of God will triumph because the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is the one that died for us. He is the one that lives for us. He is the only one worthy of worship. Now look, Revelation chapter 17, there'll be a final battle between good and evil, a final battle between Christ and Satan. In the last days, look, Revelation chapter 17, and we're going to look there at verse 12 and 13 and 14. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which have no, received no kingdom yet. We're going to study chapter 17 verse by verse and another study. As yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Notice verse 13 and 14. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. This is religion and politics uniting. This is the union of church and state. And these shall make war with the Lamb, but the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords, he is King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. We are called by God. Every single one of us is called by God. Have you felt that call in your own life? Have you felt the tugging of the Holy Spirit in your own heart? Have you sensed that you've been called by God and we're chosen, chosen to be lights in the world, chosen to be ambassadors for Christ, chosen to be the salt of the earth, chosen to be witnesses, and he says faithful. You are called by God. Your life is not an accident. You're called to be a witness for Christ in this generation. You're called not simply to mark time, not simply to get up in the morning and eat a breakfast and go to work and come home at night and eat supper and watch television. That's, that's life is much greater purpose than that. You're called by God, chosen by God to be a witness for Christ. Will you be faithful? Will you be faithful? The Lamb of God will triumph over the dragon. The Lamb of God will triumph over the beast that rises up out of the sea. The Lamb of God will triumph over the beast that rises up out of the earth. You and I are on the winning side. Christ has never lost a battle with Satan yet. And you and I, called by God, chosen by God, we can, through Christ's grace, remain faithful. If you want to say, Jesus, I want to remain faithful to you. Lord, there's some things in my life that I want to be gone. I want to surrender them to you right now. Lord, I don't want one thing to stand between you and me. Would you just lift your hand wherever you are as I pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much that we are called by God, that we are chosen by God. We long to be faithful. We can only know, do that through your grace, by your power. I pray that you would give strength to everyone watching. I pray that you would lead those watching to draw closer to you. Oh, Jesus, we love you with all of our hearts. All we want to do is serve you. 
O Father, help us to be faithful until you come again, and help us to know that we are on the winning side. In Christ's name, amen. Now remember, if you want the notes for tonight, we'll put up the place where you can get the notes. Here they are, hopelives365.com forward slash weekly Bible study. That is hopelives365.com forward slash weekly Bible study. We post the notes right after the presentation, so you should be able to get those, uh, you know, by nine o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. Some of you are watching on other times, I know, but right after we, we post the notes. If you have a question, here's where you give your question to, info at hopelives365.com. That's our um, email address, so you email us your questions. Look forward to seeing you next week. Now, next week, we're going to be studying again just an amazing topic about the rise of the United States in Bible prophecy and the union of the beast power, the first beast power of the earth, and the beast power, uh, the first beast power of the sea and the second beast power of the earth. We're going to be studying those next week, and we're going to see how, how church and state are going to unite, not only in America, but around the world, and how we can be faithful to the Lamb. Thank you for joining us. Good night, and God bless you.